welcome everybody to uh, another uh, weekly edition of the DeFord Lecture Series. Um, the second to the last DeFord Lecture for this semester. We obviously will take a break next uh, Thursday while everybody is stuffing themselves on either Tofurky or Turducken, depending upon your preference. Um, but uh, we're very happy uh, this week to have Kevin Mahan uh, here about more about Kevin in just a minute, but first let me uh, yet again remind people that this uh, lecture series has been a tradition in the department since the late 1940s, formerly uh, called Technical Sessions. Uh, it's been a venue for the dissemination of research by our own graduate students, faculty, and distinguished members from the broader community, uh, scientific community. Uh, it's named after Ronald Kennison DeFord, uh, who was a faculty member in the department, uh, joined back in 1948, and then served as the graduate advisor for the department from 1949 to 1967. Uh, he supervised a, a very large number of PhD and master's uh, dissertations and theses, uh, many of which involved field work back in West Texas. Uh, but one of his lasting contributions was uh, organizing and, and helping to run technical sessions. Um, and so a few years ago, we renamed it as the DeFord Lecture Series. And to continue this long-standing tradition, I'm very happy to welcome Kevin Mahan, uh, who's going to be talking today. And to tell us a little bit more about Kevin and his research is Phil Orlandini. Well, thanks, John. Thanks, Kevin, for being here. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Like, really excited to introduce my PhD advisor, Kevin Mahan, who fostered oh, my entire passion for the geological sciences and taught me everything that I know about it. Kevin is going to give a really cool talk that is only partially based on really cool work that I did. I'm sure the rest will be OK, too. Uh, but Kevin is really remarkable to me because Kevin spans so many different research fields and he uses so many different techniques to get at the questions that he wants to solve. And so in addition to being like, like a true like classic field geologist, you know, with stomping around in float planes and living in camps and, and the whole experience, um, Kevin uses a lot of like microanalysis to integrate kilometer scale processes all the way down to the micron scale, including EBSD, compositional mapping, compositional measurements with probe, with EDS, with, you name it, right? If it happens at the micro scale and reflects a kilometer scale process, Kevin can do it. And he can bring it back in a truck too. Uh, and not only that, in terms of analytical approaches, but the array of topics that he's interested in spans uh, deep crustal processes because uh, pretty much everything that happens in the deep crust is fascinating using both uh, the few exposures that exist in the world as well as lower crustal xenoliths, uh, metamorphic and structural fabric controls on the rheology of the earth as well as the seismic anisotropy uh, that is produced from that, as well as styles and mechanisms of crustal mass transfer, rock exhumation, as well as accessory mineral petrogenesis and in situ geochronological techniques. My God, does everything. So. I think that's good enough for right now. And Kevin, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. That was a very intimidating introduction. Um, I think I'll just sign off now. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you all for the introduction um, and for the invitation. Um, and I, I had a very interesting and enjoyable uh, series of discussions with uh, some of your faculty and, and students uh, over the last couple of hours that um, was a, a, a really uh, nice nice introduction to um, to your department and um, thanks thanks again for the invitation it's a it's a delight to be able to 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 talk to you today um, it's it's remote but still um, I'm I'm really um, uh, appreciative of the of the opportunity. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to you today about, as the title says, is uh, rheological heterogeneity or variations in rock strength in deep continental crust and, and what some of the causes of um, that might be. Um, it's, a, it's a broad topic. It's, it's a um, challenging topic um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of those is that there are just so many different factors that influence rock strength. There's uh, differential stress, strain rate, temperature, rock composition, the mineralogical makeup of, of rocks. That's, that's one of the 
points of emphasis that I want to make today. Um, there is the possibility that uh, water is present or may be absent. There is the possibility that rocks can deform in the presence of a melt phase that can have a dramatic weakening effect. Um, so lots of different factors and uh, most of them are not well constrained for deep crust, uh, particularly for in situ deep crust, but, but not even for exhumed examples of, of deep crust. Um, and there, there's also a, a really interesting and, and long standing, um, but ongoing debate about the composition, even the bulk composition of deep continental crust. Um, and for example, whether xenoliths or exhumed terrains should be considered more representative of, of what's really down there. Um, and uh, so, so lots, lots of reasons to be intimidated by such a topic uh, as I am, always am, uh, but also lots of reasons um, to be um, encouraged. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, especially in the last 20 years, um, there have been a lot of really interesting observations from uh, geophysical methods uh, of, of phenomena like slow earthquakes and subduction zones, like low frequency earthquakes and deep tremor in the deep extensions of, of um, continental faults like the Alpine Fault in New Zealand or the San Andreas Fault that, that have really challenged um, our traditional you know, and perhaps for far too long, too simplistic view of uh, deep crustal rheology. And, uh, but at the same time, have given us a lot of really good ideas for what to look for in the natural rock record for what um, kinds of um, records could actually explain those, those types of, of behavioral phenomena. And um, so we, we have a much better sense of, of what to look for in field studies. Um, there are lots of exciting technological advancements in terms of our ability to do deformation experiments and monitor various parameters in real time. Um, lots of uh, really uh, 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 impressive technological advancements in terms of hardware and software in, in terms of our ability to, to quantify the microstructures of rocks that are deformed either experimentally or naturally. Um, so lots of reasons to be encouraged about um, learning new things about uh, uh, deep, deep crustal rheology as well. So I want to use this next slide to um, just illustrate a, a general point. And I'm getting, I get a kind of a weird delayed response from my, my mouse with this laser pointer. And uh, I just I needed to reduce the um, the display of, of uh, people's faces so that I could see the, the screen that you're seeing. Um, so I, I want to use this slide to just illustrate a general point. It's a it's kind of a schematic. It's actually a graphical abstract that I made for a meeting a couple of years ago, but um, and and it was for a talk that is slightly differently structured from the, the one I'm giving today. But um, the there's kind of four different images here, and the upper right is a, a map scale sort of display of, of a simplified geometry uh, geology for a, uh, a granulite terrain in Canada that I'll tell you more about in, in a few minutes. But the other panels are schematic illustrations of, of strength versus depth through um, through continental crust. And um, the the ones on the left are meant to illustrate two different time periods. And so in one particular domain in this terrain, um, there is, you know, field evidence and petrological work and microstructural analysis that suggests that those rocks deformed uh, in the presence of a melt, and so they were, you know, relatively weak. Um, but then at a later time, uh, the rocks were much drier, both in terms of uh, the lack of a melt phase, but also much drier in terms of, of uh, water, and uh, deformed in a, in a much, uh, um, uh, or, or were stronger required greater differential stress in order to, to fail by any particular mechanism, but particularly in the deep crust when um, rocks deform through crystal plasticity and, and it's temperature dependent and also heavily dependent on, on water content. But the top, the bottom two panels side by side are also meant to illustrate um, 
the essentially the same time period, but two different spatial domains um, where there is a, a lithological distinction between um, the deeper crustal uh, dominant uh, uh, mineral phase that, that controls the, the rheology. And that's, that's one of the points that I'm going to emphasize, emphasize today. But so temporal variation in, in, in um, rheology, spatial variation in rheology, and, and there are you know, many, many other sort of um, factors that, that could influence this. But those are, those are the, the two main ones that, that this slide is meant to illustrate. So um, why is it not advancing? OK, so I want to make this point in a slightly different way. And this is using the um, Southern California Earthquake Center's community rheological model. Um, and the four panels that you see on the right are different um, slices through this three-dimensional model at a particular uh, lower crustal depth. This is at 24 kilometers depth. Um, and, and the model itself is, is a, a mixture of um, uh, a three-dimensional distribution of, of different rock types. That's what you see in the, the upper right panel. So there's um, mafic lower crust envisioned in the, in the, the basin and range in the, the northeastern part of this um, domain. Um, there's uh, peridotite, ultramafic um, rock that is at, at this depth in the upper mantle in the uh, in the southwestern uh, part of this domain. And then there's other multicolored um, uh, uh, domains that represent quartzofelspathic lower crust for the Sierra Nevada and the you know, southern extension of the Mesozoic arc. Then there's this, these yellow areas that are labeled ran schist for um, the Mojave uh, desert region of, of lower crust and another sliver up along the uh, west side of the, the Great Valley. Um, and the other part of this rheological model are flow laws for uh, a variety of different minerals and aggregates of minerals. And you can use those data along with other input parameters like strain rate, which is a background strain rate in this case, which is the upper left um, uh, image and uh, temperature. So from a thermal model, which is shown in the lower left and then calculate things like effective viscosity, which is what's shown in the, in the lower right. Um, and in this case, the, 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 the um, several orders of magnitude of variation in effective viscosity, with the exception of the thermal anomaly that is associated with the salt and trough, is largely due to the lithological variation that is, is part of this, this um, rheological model. And in contrast to that, this is another set of slices from um, the upper mantle at 60 kilometers depth. And note that the rock type in this case is all the same. It's all peridotite. Um, and the much smaller, but still maybe one to two orders of magnitude variation in uh, calculated effective viscosity, in this case is, is probably largely due to the variation in um, the, the strain rate, the, the input background strain rate. So just again, pointing out the, the potential um, significance of, of uh, rock type in, in, in uh, deep crustal rheology. So the, the, ta the talk, um, has three components. And the first two are examples of um, lithological contrasts in rheology in kilometer scale shear zones. The first one is going to be uh, from a number of studies that we've done in southwestern Montana in Proterozoic basement rocks that are exhumed in, in Laramide uplifts. And this is, I'm calling it wet crust. Um, and this is a um, it's a it's a shear zone that that deformed macroscopically ductile in in its entirety, but the type of strain that is um, expressed is partitioned based on um, a lithological variation that that um, it, um, is is related related to its rheological response. Um, the second example is dry crust in um, in an exhumed terrain in uh, the Canadian Shield, and this is. This is work that um, is, uh, in, in all, a lot of the work that I'm talking about today is um, based on graduate students and, and in some cases undergraduate students and, and other, other collaborators. Uh, the Canadian work that I'll talk about in the middle is, um, is largely uh, Phil Orlandini's work and, and you may have had an opportunity to, to hear some, um, some about this, this uh, work from, from Phil. But so this is an example of a, of a macroscopically ductile shear zone, kilometer scale shear zone that, that deformed plastically over 
long the long term, but has uh, clear field evidence for episodic brittle failure. And, and we'll talk about why that may have occurred. The third example is um, in contrast to the first two where we're looking at lithological contrast. The third example is looking at structures in lithologically homogeneous rocks, but the rheology is related to mechanical contrast. So we're looking at ductal shear zones that nucleated on fractures. In some cases, we think the fractures pre-existed and may have uh, you know, existed for a long time since or um, before being reactivated in a ductal manner. In other cases, maybe the fractures are, are close to coeval, but these are structures that we observe in mafic rocks in Montana, in the same terrain that I'll, I'll first introduce, but also in, in felsic uh, or granitic rocks in, in the Central and Eastern Alps. So the first example is in southwestern Montana. This is along the northern margin of the Archean Wyoming province. It's in um, a number of uh, crystalline basement exposures that are mostly laramide in age, the, the exposures themselves. Um, and over the last 20 years, the rock record in uh, these uh, individual ranges in southwestern Montana have really become recognized as, as an important record of a paleo proterozoic um, accretionary and, and collisional event that's probably in part associated with um, you know, the, 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 uh, the convergence of the, um, the Wyoming province with the rest of the Archean uh, core of, of North America. And, and to the north, the, the next northern block is sometimes referred to as the Medicine Hat block. It's largely buried. Um, but we know that there is a large um, Archean cratonic component there from uh, drill core and from Xenolus. And also these, this orogenic period um, that's recorded in these rocks is probably also related to uh, an accretion of a, a more juvenile terrain that is also kind of cryptic in terms of its um, level of, of exposure and, and, and what we know about it, but it's, all, it's sometimes referred to as the Selway terrain. Um, so um, the record in southwestern Montana specifically is sometimes also referred to as the big sky origin. That term was coined by Tecla Harms and, and others that worked with her uh, in a series of studies in the tobacco root range specifically. And this schematic cross section that's illustrated here is from their work. And, and I'm showing it to just point out that most of the structures that are attributed to this paleo proterozoic big sky origin are contractional structures that generally bring up deep rocks from the northwest and, and place them over uh, shallower rocks to the southeast. And so this image is, is looking to the northeast with northwest on your left and, and southeast on your right. But the structure that I want to emphasize today is a, a late strike slip shear zone that is recorded in one of the ranges in uh, southwestern Montana. And this we think probably is mostly related to accretion of that more juvenile selway terrain from the from the west and in, in modern day coordinates anyway. Um, there is a similar uh, conjugate uh, shear zone that has been documented that developed at about the same time in the Black Hills in South Dakota. And those who have studied that structure attribute it to a, a late sort of reorientation of the convergence direction of the superior province with the Wyoming province. And so in reality, maybe some of the um, some of these late strike slip structures are reflecting multiple accretionary processes that impinged on on the Wyoming province from from both sides. But um, in, in any event, it's a um, it's a it's a, a relatively late stage and dominantly strike slip structure. So I've just jumped to a, a more detailed map of a particular range in southwestern Montana. This is the northern Madison range. If you're familiar with southwestern Montana, Bozeman is just to the upper right near the corner of this map area, or Big Sky, Montana. The ski resort is um, sort of in the middle of the legend for this map. Um, and this particular range has been of interest to me and, and those that have worked with, uh, with me at, at uh, CU for the last 10 years or so because uh, the record here suggests that there is quite a variation in paleo depth preserved at about 1.7 GA, sort of late in the big sky origin. And the rocks at the northwestern end of the range, we think were at depths of about 40 kilometers at that time. 
in the middle of the range. We think they were at 25 to, to, to maybe as, as much as 30 kilometers, but 25 is probably more representative for the particular structure I want to talk about today. And then to the southeast, rocks at that same time may have been shallower than 10 kilometers. And the reason for that is because of a, a, a feature called Gilletti's line, which is a, a construct based on thermochronological data from potassium argon and argon argon data that if interpreted at face value, what it means is that rocks to the southeast of that line haven't been heated above about three to 400 degrees Celsius since the late Archean. So at 1.7 GA time, this was upper crust. Um, so we've been doing a number of different studies throughout this range to try and get a better handle on the internal structure of this apparent exhumed oblique section through, through crust. But again, the one structure I want to emphasize is called the Hellroaring Creek Shear Zone, and it's near the southeastern end of the range, but still um, northwest of Gilletti's line. And I'm going to zoom in one more time. So this structure is uh, about a three kilometer wide zone of high strain. There are a variety of different rock types that are exposed. This map is showing different rock types in various colors. Don't, you don't need to worry too much about the um, the, the, the details of the lithological variation, but there, there is uh, quartzite that the one prominent body of quartzite is shown in this blue band. Um, and that lithology has um, mineral assemblages that are well, uh, well suited for quantitative uh, thermobarometry. And, and, and we use those to, to estimate the pressure and temperature conditions that we think this shear zone is deforming at at the current level of exposure, and that's about 0.75 gigapascals and maybe 700 degrees Celsius, so about 25 kilometers depth. Um, shear zones are also characterized by strain gradients, and this particular shear zone has some well-defined ones on both sides. So for example, to the Northwest, there is a, a, a distinctive megachristic granodiorite that is, is um, relatively undeformed outside of the shear zone. You can still see many places where you see uh, magmatic structures like magmatic foliation and mi mingling textures and so forth. And then the, that granite is uh, progressively grain size reduced as you um, go towards the interior of the shear zone. Similarly, on the southeastern side, rocks are much lower strained in terms of shear zone related deformation. But in this case, there is a record of a much um, of, of an intense period of earlier deformation. And what you're looking at is an ultramafic schist with a penetrative foliation that's, that's dipping relatively shallowly. And then the, it's, it's been folded into these upright structures. The fold traces are shown by the, the yellow dashed lines and those folds we would attribute to the, to the shear zone. In the interior, the rocks are much more intensely uh, deformed and, and the foliation is more intensely developed. It's very steeply oriented. The stretching lineation is well developed. Um, and we see a, a number of um, types of structures that are characteristic of high strain. And so one example here is a isoclinal fold. You can sort of follow my laser pointer around this, the nose of this isoclinal structure. Um, we also see abundant evidence for um, sheath folds, other structures that are indicative of high strain. The stretching lineations in this uh, shear zone have an interesting geometrical distribution that's bimodal. Uh, throughout most of the width of the shear zone and in most rock types, the stretching lineation is very steeply oriented. The image in the lower left is an outcrop image of the foliation surface and these white streaks are uh, stretched felspar rich porphyroclasts, and they plot near the center of the Stereonet on the right, indicating subvertical stretching, and um, but the the shear sense indicators are uh, best developed on subhorizontal surfaces that are perpendicular to that stretching lineation, and this this particular image is taken on the outcrop surface, looking um, down in in the direction of that stretching lineation. There are a number of asymmetric porphyroclasts that indicate dextral shear. Um, so this phenomenon of seeing um, shear sense indicators that are on surfaces at a high angle to the stretching lineation is um, characteristic of a, of a type of transpression where the pure shear component, the component that accommodates shortening across the shear zone is more dominant than 
um, the transcurrent or the simple shear component that that uh, accommodates um, transcurrent motion. Um, in some rock types in this shear zone, the ones that tend to be quartz rich, the quartzites and uh, leucogranites have a much more shallowly oriented stretching lineation. So on this image, this outcrop face is a quartzite foliation surface. It's mostly covered in lichen, but there is a patch in the middle of the, the exposure where perhaps you can see the shallowly oriented stretching lineation. Those data plot near the, the margin of the stereonet. And this um, distribution of uh, um, shallow lineations in some rock types and steeply uh, oriented uh, lineations in others is also indicative of uh, a type of transgression where the simple shear component is partitioned into the rheologically weaker material. In this case, I would argue the, the quartz rich material like the quartzite and, and the leucogranite and the subvertical stretching and pure shear component is uh, concentrated in the more competent bodies. So there's one other aspect of the shear zone that is worth noting here. And this suggests that the steep stretching lineation also may have an inherited component. And I wanna use this ridge top to make, to, to illustrate that. So just to set it up, the, the rock type in the foreground is white and that's a Muscovite granite myelinite the image, or, or rather the, the, the darker material in the middle distance is mostly a, a relatively undeformed um, ultramafic body, uh, but the margin at the contact between the ultramafic body and this Muscovite granite is a three meter or so wide band of, of mafic rock. And the next outcrop image is looking to your right on a surface that is parallel to the steep stretching lineation. So now you're looking to the northeast on a surface that is mostly subvertical, parallel to that stretching lineation. And this mafic rock is uh, migmatitic. The texture suggests that it experienced some partial melting with garnet, which is the, you know, the, the red porphyroblastic phase, as a peritectic phase, a solid product of the melting reaction. And this suggests that um, uh, I mean, this is a mafic rock. On average, it probably had a basaltic composition or approximately basaltic composition. And uh, from experimental work, I think this requires pressure and temperature conditions that are distinctly higher uh, than what we think were ambient conditions during um, strike slip motion on, on the, the broader shear zone. So I think this may be consistent uh, with uh, the notion that we have some more vertical extrusion um, and locally deeper levels of, of rock brought up in, in the, the portions of the shear zone that are dominated by the, by the pure shear component. It's not, uh, it doesn't require that, but it's, it's uh, consistent with that and, and um, could be tested further in the future, but it's an, it's an interesting possibility. Okay, so the second example is in the uh, can Western Canadian Shield in the, in the Churchill province. And it, this is a, a granulite terrain that occurs along a much broader uh, a long strike feature called the Snowbird Tectonic Zone, which cuts across much of the Western Churchill province. This particular terrain is called the Athabasca Granulite Terrain. It's named after its proximity to Lake Athabasca and, and uh, also um, to its proximity to a, a younger, undeformed, uh, an unmetamorphosed Proterozoic sedimentary basin called Athabasca Basin that's known for its uranium deposits. But the portion of the Athabasca terrain that I want to focus on is this triangular region. And I'm just zooming into this area. And there's one particular structure here that I want to talk about too. It's called the Cora Lake Shear Zone. It's uh, also like the previous structure, dominantly a strike slip structure. And it separates this triangular region, which is also sometimes referred to as the East Athabasca Milanite Triangle, um, into two domains. And to the Northwest is a domain that is creatively referred to as the Northwestern domain. And it is dominantly late Archean, calc-alkaline granitoid rocks, granites and granodiorite um, that are part of what's called the Mary Batholith. Um, there's also, what well, and, and the, the batholithic rocks are shown in red, there's also a mafic component that is shown in purple. And the other rock type that is characteristic of this domain is um, the unit shown in yellow, which is a 
generically we refer to it as felsic granulite and, and some of it probably has an igneous protolith but others um, probably have a, a sedimentary protolith as well but and, and I'll show you outcrop photos of each of those in just a minute. So to the southeast is uh, a, the Chipman domain it's also dominantly a single batholithic um, complex it's a tonalite batholith for the most part but there are some mafic components that are distributed throughout it and, and in, in such a way that um, some of the earlier mappers, including Simon Hanmer and others with the uh, Canadian Geological Survey, suggested that the, this tonalite batholith, which is also older, it's a Mesoarchean um, complex, when it was in place, probably disrupted a, a nearly coeval mafic uh, complex. And, and that's what we're seeing in, in the mafic components. And those mafic components are concentrated at the present level of exposure along the northwestern margin where they're incorporated into the Core Lake Shear Zone. So in general, I think probably in terms of a 3.2 GA picture of this, of this um, batholith, I think we could be looking at a, an oblique exposure through it so that we're at near the northwestern edge, we're closer to the root of that, uh, of that complex and seeing more of the mafic components. Okay, so the next image is zooming in a little bit more on a particular section of the shear zone. Again, it's it's dominantly strike slip. It's a sinistral strike slip structure. There is a, a foliation um, and a and a inferred shear plane that dips um, uh, steeply to the northwest, and there is an ob ob oblique stretching lineation that, um, unlike the the previous example, in this case we do see um, the best shear sense indicators. On, par on surfaces that are parallel to the stretching lineation. That's the more, um, that's the more conventional uh, uh, type of observation for shear zones that are dominated by simple shear. And that suggests that this structure does have a little bit of a, a normal sense of dip slip motion, but again, it's mostly strike slip. Um, the mineral assemblages suggest that deformation in this shear zone were hot and dry. Um, thermochronological studies uh, by others suggest that this, this shear zone was active during a cooling uh, interval from about 800 degrees on the high temperature side to about 650 degrees and probably during some decompression from about 1 to 0.75 gigapascals. So again, we're looking at 35 to 25 kilometer paleo depths. Um, the, the two rock types that, that, that I want to emphasize on the northwest side, again, is Mary Granite. And this is an image of the Mary Granite uh, showing some really well-defined um, SCC prime asymmetric uh, composite fabrics that indicate sinistral shear. Um, you can also see quartz ribbons that are in this sort of gray translucent material, felspar porphyroclasts. The darker material is the mafic component. It's a completely anhydrous assemblage that um, has no mica. Um, very, there, is, there is some uh, synkinematic amphibole in some of the rock types, but, but none in, uh, in, in, the, in the Mary Granite where it's incorporated into the shear zone. So that mafic component is mostly garnet and clinopyroxene, and in some cases, some relic igneous orthopyroxene. The other rock type, which is shown in yellow on this map is the felsic granulite. It's characteristically very light in color. Um, and in this image, there's basically, there's two components. There's a light colored material. The white material is typically a very fine grain um, mixture of quartz and feldspar. And then the only mafic phase is garnet, which is the light pink um, aggregate that you see. And then there's a, usually an alumina silicate. In some cases, in other parts of the terrain, it's kyanite. In the Core Lake shear zone, it's um, it's always sulmonite. Um, so on the on the southeastern side of the shear zone is a northosite of the Chipman batholith, and this is an outcrop image that shows uh, ultra myelinitized anorthosite. There's two components here. It's a layered um, uh, 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 type of exposure, typically, and and the white layer is the anorthosite itself. It's it's dominantly plagioclase. It's, 80 to 90% plagioclase. There is a garnet and clinopyroxene that is, is also characteristic, but relatively minor component. The darker layers are um, garnet mafic granulite. So essentially the, the same mineral assemblage, but a much higher proportion of, of the mafic um, components. Um, right along the boundary um, at the type locality, this particular lake that's shown in white is called Core Lake. 
um, is uh, evidence for multiple generations of uh, pseudotacolite, which is a fault generated um, frictional melt associated with uh, uh, fault slip and, and typically uh, considered to be fault slip at, at seismic rates. Uh, and so typically when we see uh, pseudotacolite in, in, in uh, the rock record, it's, it's considered a, you know, a fossilized or a record of fossilized earthquakes. And we typically see these veins uh, in spatial association with structures like this uh, sort of semi-ductal uh, shear, shear um, fracture. Uh, but we also see evidence for, as I said, multiple generations. The youngest generations um, uh, have uh, classic quench textures like this SEM image on the right is showing. We also see in, in outcrop structures like injection veins that are oriented at a high angle to the, to the generation surface that are, are also um, characteristic of the undeformed varieties. But then there are deformed varieties. And the image on the left is an outcrop showing two different veins. One is relatively undeformed. The other is, is, uh, has been myelinatized. And the image on the right is a closer up image of that, of that same vein that's been um, reworked in a, in, a, in a plastic sense. And sometimes when we look at these uh, veins in, in thin section, you can see structures like this. This is an image that shows a myelinatized pseudotacolite. The, the dark material is, is the fine-grained pseudotacolite matrix. The lighter colored material, we think, were probably originally angular fragments of, of the wall rock that were incorporated into the vein uh, when it, when it um, initially formed, but has now been um, Remyelinatized and the mineral assemblages that are associated with that younger overprinting um, shear strain is uh, is the same mineral assemblage that we see in in the host myelinite. It's it's dry granulite facies to upper amphibolite facies mineral assemblages. So um, uh, suggesting this that same same essentially coeval with the dominant shear zone and under the same pressure and temperature conditions. Okay, so this next image shows some of the more quantifiable components across, um, across the shear zone. And, and what's shown here is modal mineralogy, and we're focusing on quartz and feldspar. And on the northwestern side, um, in bold, is shown the, um, the quartz to plagioclase ratio, which is one to three typically. And then as you cross into the Chipman domain, that drops to about 0.1. So there's about an order of magnitude um, decrease in the abundance of quartz relative to plagioclase. The other lines are uh, quartz separately and then plagioclase separately with the percentage scale on, on the right side. So recrystallized grain size also varies um, by about an order of magnitude. It's typically about 100 microns or several tens of microns in the margin of the shear zone. And then as you get towards the core near this boundary, it um, decreases to about 10 microns or even less. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, about 100 microns on, on, the, on the opposite side. So experimental um, uh, uh, calibrations of, of recrystallized grain size with flow stress can be used to, to estimate paleo differential stress. And so that's what um, uh, uh, Phil has done here. Um, and so that also shows uh, sort of mimicking the grain size variation uh, a, a suggestion that um, differential stress was elevated near that boundary, uh, probably to um, at least 175 megapascals. The data suggests maybe up to 200 megapascals. In reality, those stresses were probably even higher. Um, but um, so at this point, we're assuming that quartz is probably the dominant uh, rheologically controlling uh, phase on the northwestern side of, of the shear zone, and plagioclase uh, probably is the dominant phase on, on, the, uh, on the southeastern side. And so we can use flow laws for those phases, for dry versions of those phases in this case, which we think is probably most uh, appropriate for the shear zone, to then show um, effective uh, viscosity. And so that's what's plotted here. That's what's contoured. In green are contours for plagioclase effective viscosity and red for quartz effective viscosity plotted against temperature on the y-axis. And we think this shear zone was active during cooling from 800 to 650 or so. And so time is also plotted on the y-axis. And so an, essentially an evolution through shear zone activity from top down. And just to make it a little bit easier to, to, to uh, read this diagram, I've 
identified some points where those contours cross to just indicate that at the high temperature end of the spectrum, there was um, at least a two order of magnitude difference in effective viscosity. And as this shear zone continued to deform on cooling, that contrast probably increased by several more orders of magnitude. So to show that in a slightly different way, you can just assume a fixed uh, grain size and plot effective viscosity um, versus temperature slash time on the x-axis here. And so plagioclase for the um, proxy for the Chipman domain um, versus quartz uh, as a proxy for the Northwestern domain. And then this is the difference in, in uh, calculated effective viscosity. So the idea is that the, the um, strength contrast at this boundary we think was enough that um, differential stresses were enhanced um, to the point where uh, episodically uh, the stronger material fell brittly in the form of the shear fractures and, and, and also episodically in, in, in the pseudotacolite. So um, the third example is different from the first two in that we're now looking at lithologically homogeneous materials, um, but looking at, at uh, a mechanical form of rheological contrast. And so in southwestern Montana, in the same domain, um, these are paleoproterozoic shear zones that um, developed within gabbroite dikes, gabbro, gabbro norite dikes. And in the Central and Eastern Alps, these are late Variscan granites, so Permian aged granites that host um, Alpine aged uh, ductal shear zones. And in both cases, we think that they nucleated on pre existing fractures. And, and I mentioned that in some cases, we think those fractures could have, you know, been uh, around for a long time. And, and that's the case in Montana. And that's partly based on observations of undeformed, uh, at least in, this, in, the, in the ductal sense, uh, fractures that, um, uh, that are lined with a, a, a mineral assemblage that we think is, is an earlier metamorphic mineral assemblage. Whereas in the Alps, the, the, the thinking is that um, these fractures may actually be alpine fractures as well. Uh, and maybe coeval or, or nearly coeval um, with the uh, ductal reactivation and based largely on, on kinematic arguments for, from uh, geometries and so forth. So the image on the left is a, a two, two images of a, a, a meta rhyolite. Um, this is a fracture that hasn't been reactivated ductally. This is a pair of fractures that in the, on the bottom that have a little bit of an incipient foliation develop. And they're all centimeter scale structures. The one on the right is from a granite that is a little bit larger in scale. It's about a meter across. Um, and uh, this is in uh, granite from the southern part of the Tarn window in, in the Eastern Alps. So whether we're talking about the mafic rocks in Montana or the granites in, in the Alps, the, the general characteristics are, are the same, which is that they all um, suggest that there was a major influx of aqueous fluid um, that uh, allowed for a variety of different mechanisms, deformation mechanisms to operate across the strain gradients, including fracturing and dislocation creep in the margins and, and a fluid assisted diffusion creep in the, in the, in the core. Um, and uh, just to give an example of the kinds of observations that, that, that we use to make that, that suggestion, this next image is a, a photomicrograph um, on the left that uh, is, um, so this is actually, so the, the, the trace of the foliation is, is vertical and the interior of this image is plagioclase and there's several components that are relatively coarse grained and you can see some albite twinning. Um, and then there's some small fractures that disrupt that albite twinning. And some of those fractures are lined by scapolite, which is a high temperature metasomatic uh, mineral that, that commonly grows at the expense of feldspar. And uh, the image on the right is a, a false color um, image of electron backscatter diffraction data that gives us an idea of the variation in crystallographic orientation. The interior part is that's mostly colored peach, peach colored is the, the relic igneous plagioclase with the albite twins. The fractures are traced with the black dashed lines. And then it's surrounded by this multicolored aggregate of, of, of you know, equant grains of, of what we interpret as, as a younger, dynamically recrystallized uh, population of, of uh, plagioclase. So um, in general, these structures uh, 
while the minerals were that were involved in the process were different in the granites than they were for the gabbro. So in this image, granite across the top, gabbro across the bottom, and and um, protomyelinite or marginal shear zone uh, expression on the left side and towards the core and the ultramyelinitic center of the shear zone on the right side. Um, so the minerals were different, um, but the processes were generally the same. So mostly dislocation creep and microfracturing in the margin, um, giving way to a texture and a mineral assemblage that's indicative of um, fluid assisted um, diffusion creep or grain boundary sliding in the interior in the ultramyelinitic core. And in this case, the shear zones nucleated on presumably very discrete uh, surfaces, fracture surfaces. And, and so typically we think of shear zones that have found a way to, to, to weaken to the point where the shear, where the strain is localized are just going to stay that way and stay lo localized in the weak material. But these shear zones clearly grew uh, to some finite width. Um, and, and the argument is that what drove that uh, widening was the was 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 two things really the mechanical grain size reduction and fracturing that increased uh you know um uh, surface area and the addition of water which dramatically changed uh the the, the metamorphic um uh drivers for for reaction and um and uh, destabilize the pre-existing anhydrous mineral assemblage uh, so both a mechanical and a, and a chemical uh, set of processes that allowed the wall rocks to weaken and, and expand um, the, the, the ductile part of the shear zone. Okay, so just to summarize, I've given you two examples of kilometer scale shear zones with lithological contrast in rheology. The one in Montana, entirely ductile, at least macroscopically, but the type of strain is partitioned based on a rheological contrast that we think is tied to, to, to rock type and, and quartz rich versus uh, more felspathic rich uh, material. In Canada, a much drier setting where, um, again, quartz and plagioclase dominant lithologies at the kilometer scale allowed for a localized uh, differential stress enhancement that, that produced uh, a episodic or schizophrenic behavior between plastic deformation and episodic brittle failure. And the mechanical contrast in the, in the lithologically homogeneous rocks in both mafic rocks in Montana and, and, and granitic rocks in, in the Alps. Um, so let me just finish with a couple of other concluding thoughts. Um, and one is that th there is definitely um, evidence from a variety of studies over the last few years that, that, that plastic and, and brittle deformation um, uh, you know, go hand in hand in many ways. And there is a, a, a you know, close interplay between them uh, in many types of deep continental crust. Uh, I've given an example here, uh, but we could also look at slow earthquakes and subduction zones. We can look at low frequency earthquakes and tremor observations and in uh, deep fault or deep extensions of faults like the San Andreas. The image that's shown here is a, in a long strike um, cross section showing some of David Shelley's compilation of of low frequency earthquakes and the color coding here goes with the kilometer scale um, depth uh, profile on, on the right. There's also a lot of evidence that water plays an important role in this type of behavior. And um, again, uh, examples here, the, the shear zones uh, that uh, developed in, in the Gabbroic dikes in Montana and the Alps uh, granitoids, uh, water played a very clear role in, in that evolution slow earthquakes and subduction zones. That's a, that's a saturated environment. Um, many believe that the deep San Andreas is wet. Um, and we could also look at some classical field-based studies like um, the ones in Norway and the Bergen Arc where water is thought to play a critical role in the formation of, of uh, eclogite and deep crustal pseudotacolite. This image at the bottom is a outcrop photo of um, the Bergen arc uh, gran granulites and eclogites, so the light colored blocks are paleoproterozoic granulite, dry granulite, surrounded by darker material, which is essentially the same rock type, but it has been converted into eclogite during Caledonian uh, time. And the, the boundaries are commonly lined with uh, pseudotacolite. And it, it, my impression from these studies is that it's not necessarily clear 
what came first, whether the water came first and hydrofract the rock or whether the, the fractures came first and the, and the fluid then um, found a way to exploit them. Um, but there's a pretty clear relationship between uh, water and, and those processes. But um, that doesn't appear to be the case in the, in the Canadian examples of, of deep pseudotacolite. Uh, to this point, uh, all indications suggest that those rocks deformed and the pseudotacolite formed in uh, a, a dry environment. How dry is still kind of an open question, but at least dry enough that there was no free fluid phase. There's no synkinematic hydrous uh, mineral assemblage uh, that's recognizable. And so my point is that there must be other ways to, to, to produce at least um, deep crustal pseudotacolite. And, and we think that um, in places where there is enough uh, kilometer scale lithological contrast, and maybe it doesn't need to be kilometer scale, but lithological contrasts that are dramatic enough to induce uh, strong strength contrast uh, may be enough to, to locally enhance stresses to the point where we have some brittle failure. Final point is that, and I alluded to it earlier, um, that there's a, especially in the last decade, there's a really interesting renewed debate about bulk composition of deep continental crust and, and whether we should be paying more attention to the potential for felsic material down there, whether it's igneous felsic rocks or, or perhaps more interestingly, a greater abundance of, of sedimentary derived rock that has somehow made its way into the, into the lower crust. And there are several different mechanisms for how that might happen, but, but one of them that has been suggested by Brad Hacker and others that they call relamination um, and the image in the upper right illustrates this, is that the buoyancy of, of felsic rocks that are taken down to ultra high pressure conditions in subduction zones may be enough to eventually separate that material from the rest of the downgoing slab and allow it to rise and um, get somehow incorporated into the overriding portion of, of the lower crust. And I would just point out that the two terrains that I described um, in Canada and, and in Montana uh, have a, a, a significant portion of felsic material. And just to point out the yellow rock type that you see in, in these simplified maps, those are uh, quartzites and quartz-rich felsic granulites that re regardless of the mechanism for how they became ultimately incorporated into the deep crust, they're there and they're there in abundance, at least in certain domains. And so the point is that I think there is a lot of potential for some pretty significant lithological contrast that may correspond to, to rheological variation in, in deep, deep crust in general. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you what very much, Kevin. Yeah. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um,